I was pretty much raised in horse racing and around it. In fact, I grew up in a trailer park in between Shenandoah Downs and Charlestown. And uh, almost every night when the announcer, whose name was Costi Karras, would uh, say the horses are two minutes to post, I'd run over, get on the fence with the gate crew and watch the horses load and watch them run and run back to the trailer and watch TV to the next race. I heard two minutes to post, I'd do it all again. Now, my father was a jock. My mother was one of the first women mutual clerks in America and, like I said, pretty much grew up in it. Uh, my senior year in high school, I was lucky to win the state championship 107 wrestling. I had opportunities to go to a few different colleges. I visited, um, talked with my father, and he said, well, why don't you try to start riding in August? And see if you like it see whether you're going to make it and uh, if, if you don't like it you can go to college in September so by the time it was time to go to college I already won 30 races so I guess I kept my career going luckily and you had a uh, full scholarship to go to Iowa right? well I had a scholarship to go to the University of Iowa um, they flew me there and I visited it was, it was as, as nice a place as you'd ever want to be and uh, if I didn't get lucky right away riding, I, I probably would have tried it there. I don't know if I would have been good enough because I wasn't quite big enough for a 123. And uh, when I really weighed everything out, and like I said, I got lucky early, um, I just stuck with riding. I figured if something happened, I could always pay my own way to go to college. Back then, tuition was $300 a semester. So I figured if I could make a little bit of money and it didn't work out, I could always go back. I never had to. I wish I would have sometimes, but um, everything worked out pretty good for me. I tickled to death in my decision. Okay. And um, mention, um, so you started out at Shan Shannon Oak. Well, actually, you said you were, what, six years old or five, five on the ponies? <laughs> yeah, I rode my first race five years old at uh, the county fair at Shenandoah Downs. And, um, like I said, 17, I started riding. I rode my first race at Shenandoah Downs, Charlestown. We were going to Hagerstown in the day and back to Charlestown at night. Um, and it just kept um, getting better and better. And I hooked up with one of the top agents in the country that had had great riders before me. And I uh, went to the mile tracks and, and everything's pretty much history from there. Okay. Now mention, of course, one of the big horses a lot of people remember, Ruffian. What was your connection with Ruffian and Green Tree Stables? Well, when um, I guess I was about 14 or 15, I just started galloping. Frank Whiteley came to Charlestown in the, win in the winter with some young horses. And my father was galloping some for him. And I remember that one day it snowed real bad. And I was there in the barn and they threw me on one of the young horses and we were galloping out in the field in the snow. And he wanted the horses to go head and tail so that the snow would come back and act like the horses were getting dirt in their face. And those bumps put me last. So I got hammered with snowballs all the way around the field two or three times. But that's how I met Mr. Whiteley. And later on, when uh, Jacinto Vasquez was riding her and he got set down, um, I was lucky that Mr. Whiteley asked me to ride her. And then Jacinto rode her again, and then we, w we went to Saratoga and he got set down again. I got to ride her in the spin away. Oh, it's a great field, and Villa, from between horses, Ruffian takes the early lead, Scottish Melody on the outside is second, Laughing Bridge in third position, some swinger on the rail is fourth, down the back stretch, Ruffian has the lead, by one length, Scottish Melody is second, a length and a quarter, Laughing Bridge is third by a length and three quarters, and some swinger races fourth.
They move past the half mile pole and now round the far turn. Ruffian draws away to lead by two and a half as Laughing Bridge takes over second position by a length and a quarter. Scottish Melody is third by six lengths. Some Swinger is fourth as they come to the top of the stretch. Ruffian in command by two lengths. Laughing Bridge now second by three. Scottish Melody third and Some Swinger. The quartet straightens away in the stretch. Ruffian in front by three and a half lengths. With Laughing Bridge is second, the Scottish Melody on the inside third, and Some Swinger is fourth. Coming to the 16th pole, Ruffian now draws away to lead by eight. By ten, it's Ruffian going easily in front. A magnificent performance as Ruffian, eased under the wire by jockey Vince Pacelli Jr., takes the 83rd running of the spinaway stakes. That was the easiest victory I've seen in some time. Laughing Bridge was second. There was no show wagering. Yeah, a couple days ago, one of the agents here, Jay Burtis, who's agent for Forrest Boyce, he's a, uh, mm, a buff on going to flea markets and stuff, and at one of the flea markets, he found this picture of Ruffian, and just so happened, he brought it in here a couple days ago and gave it to me. Now, the original one of this, one that I bought when she won the spin away, I had donated um, to... Uh, Chris Grove's son ha had to get a, uh, a new prostate, and they had a, a fundraiser. Prosthetic leg, yeah. Prosthetic leg. Yeah. They had a fundraiser over here at Laurel, and uh, uh, they auctioned it off. And this is the spin away, and you said you set a, a record uh, on that day. That was August the uh, 23rd, 1974. Which he was roughing was a two year old. Very cool. So you wrote her in the, the spin away, and that was at age when she was age two, right? Right. Right. And uh, are you still uh, captivated by the interest in her? Because she's kind of like a, a legend, even though there's been some other fillies that have been pretty successful since her. Well, yeah, you have to remember. A couple things about it. One was, I was I was pretty young, and I, at the time, I had a little experience riding um, some grade one races, but uh, never really had an opportunity like this. And I can remember getting ready to get on the horse in the paddock and waiting for Mr. Whiteley to give me some instructions or talk about the horse somewhat, and. Um, I looked at him and he, he just said, don't get her hurt and don't get her beat. And I remember walking out on the track and she was getting a standing ovation before the race. So now the race runs. Uh, she broke in front, made the lead real easy. I was slowing her down around the turn just to maybe stay a length or two in front. And um, never really moved on her and she won by 15 lengths and at the end I was the last eighth of a mile was slowing her down again. So I, I galloped out to the uh, outrider, Jimmy Daly. And he says, God, boy, this grandstand is screaming. How fast do you think he ran? I said, Jim, I never let her run. I said, they're running 111s and 112s at the meet. I said, I, I have no clue because, like I said, I never asked her for anything. And we galloped back, she ran 108 and 3. I mean, I was just, I couldn't believe it. She so was something. You said she was kind of set stake records of different tracks? I think she either had a stakes record or, or track record every start she made. Well, wow. Even with Jacinto Vasquez. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's funny that you mentioned Jacinto. When I was here, he wound up calling you, and you said you speak often with him, right? Well, I, I sort of made a... a an option in my life to keep in touch with a bunch of the guys I rode for. Craig Perrett, Donnie Brumfield, Jacinto, and a bunch of others. Um, we try to call each other once a week, twice a week. Just like the other day when the bridge came down, they were all, they were all calling me early in the morning here. And uh, it's been great to keep in contact. A lot of fun. The, the best part of, for me, one of the best parts of riding is 
the camaraderie we had. In Maryland, we had a hell of a good group. At Monmouth, we had a hell of a good group. Um, a couple of years I was in New York, I got along good with everybody. Most of the guys, not most of them, a lot of the guys were Spanish, but um, we joined in pretty good. Okay. Did you get the name Jimbo, the nickname? You ride at Aqueduct. You ride at Aqueduct, and it had the tunnel there, when you had to go under the tunnel. And all the fans, after Jimbo would win a race, he could walk back through the tunnel, and they would all be cheering like that, you know, a circus or something. Jimbo, Jimbo, Jimbo! <laughs> That's how you get the name Jimbo. <laughs> so. No, really, my, mo my mother called me Bo when I was little. And, um, Kind of customary in Italian. Um, if your name is Vincent, a lot of times they call you Jim, like Richard, Dickie, Robert, Bob. So I'm playing Little League. My mom's calling me Bo, and everybody knew me as Jim. So all of a sudden it was Jimbo, Jimbo. And it kind of stuck all, all through my career, even till now. And you uh, now you're, you're training and. and uh... You said you retired a few years ago because, well, several years ago, and how did you get into wanting to train? Well, I always loved the horses more than the people, and um, I guess I, I really started raising horses. I wanted to sell them at the sale, and the sales kind of went a little ugly, and I had some nice young horses, and next thing I know I was at the track with them, and I got real lucky early, and I've been here 32 years. Okay.